Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello, everybody. This is Seth with the world of paleoanthropology, and I know it's been a while since we've had a new The Story of Us episode, but I'm very excited to be bringing on our new guest, Professor Mark Kissel, and I will hand it over to him to talk a little bit about himself before we move on and just introduce who he is. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you. And of course, like everyone, I hate talking about myself, so I'm going to try <laughs> to do this anyway. Um, so yeah, my name is Mark. I'm a assistant professor at Appalachian State University, which is in sort of um, in North Carolina in the Appalachian Mountains, as the name applies, sort of at the intersection of uh, North Carolina and Tennessee. I've been here for a couple of years now, um, and my research is sort of in paleoanthropology, human origins, human evolution, and of late as well, sort of thinking of a uh, pedagogy and how do we best teach students about these topics in ways that are mean meaningful for them, uh, the sort of umbrella thing I work with is that, generally speaking, I'm an anthropologist in the rural South. Most of my students are only taking one anthropology class in their life. So I get one shot to convince them about sort of, you know, the causes and consequences of human variation. So, yeah, that's who I am. And, um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm super glad to have you. I have been very excited for this interview. So... As you mentioned, that brings up an interesting question that I have. You live in an area where anthropology is not a big subject. What are you doing to try to change that in your mind? Oof. Starting with the big questions, eh, Seth? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I try to do, and whether I'm good at this or not, is someone else's... Uh, should weigh in is to sort of show the relevance of anthropology. So I guess my best example is when I teach either the sort of general intro to biological anthropology class, which is not just anthropology students, but also people just, you know, in, in college who need their gen eds or a check sheet finished, or I also teach something called gender race in class, which is a large course as well, mostly for non-anthropologists, is I sort of, in some sense, preach to them that none of them need to leave the class knowing you know, Lucy's cranial capacity. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of thing that I might have to know if they become experts, they have to know, but that's not really the relevance, right? I want them to leave the class understanding that sort of what it means to be human is sort of a very inclusive sense that allows us to understand you know, the origins of things we see today, you know, classism, racism, sexism, and that so many of my students are engaged. You know, they want to fight for social rights and social justice. So I see my job as saying, hey, here's some data from anthropology that could help you along your way. So the sort of shorter answer to your question is, I see my role as, here's what we know about the past. You know, you alluded to this. I mean, not just here. I mean, I think in most parts of the United States, people don't know what anthropology is. And mm. that's sort of on us, right? We need to make a concerted effort to say, hey, we have this data. People argue about human variation all the time. And we anthropologists sometimes wonder why no one's coming to ask us. When reality, we have to sort of make ourselves a space at the table. So what I try to do is do that in the classes, right? Try to make it relevant to them, not relevant to me. And then as well, sort of, you know, in different ways, going to the local community, talking to them. I work a lot, um, not so much during COVID, but I used to work a lot with, uh, seminary students and uh, theologians thinking about how can they use the science of human origins to help their you know congregates better understand you know these sort of the questions that, that they get um as sort of parishioners and i think the way you put that is a great way of just explaining that yeah anthropology is not well known and it is the job of people who are professors and science communicators to inform everyone because 
I feel like everyone can learn something from anthropology, something. Whether they like it or agree with it, you know, there's something out there in anthropology that has a lesson for, I think, everyone. And I think as well, as we forget, it's fundamentally interesting, right? I mean, that's the lucky thing about being an anthropologist, especially for on the human evolution side of things. There's nobody who doesn't care about who their ancestors were. That's why 23andMe is worth over like $3 billion or something like this, right? Yeah. People want to know these things. And we have a fundamentally fascinating and interesting story to tell people. So I think it does, yeah, it, like we said, a science communication is really sort of saying, hey, we have this data, let's talk about it and talk about it in a way that's meaningful to other people, right? That yes, in our own networks, we could get into the nitty gritty of super ENIAC fossils, but in reality, the public wants a story, right? And we learn through these stories about what, you know, how we became human, what does it mean to be human? And to tell these really sort of fundamentally interesting hypotheses about where we come from. And Importantly, and I actually haven't, I don't usually ask this question, I'm not sure why, but you seem to be someone who will be able to answer it quite well. When we're talking about people who are dead set in their beliefs on certain things, such as the earth is 6,000 years old, et cetera, how do you talk to these people in a way that is non-offensive, but will possibly open new doors for them? No, that is a very good question. And I wish I had a succinct answer. What I tend to do, and I'm not sure if you've come across this or people listening to this have, is this a theory, I think it's from neuroscience called the backfire effect. And essentially what the backfire effect says is that you know, there's emotional facts and logical facts. And logical facts and emotional facts are stored in different parts of the brain. So when you have a logical fact, you can sometimes convince somebody with other facts that they are wrong and they can change their opinion on something, right? Emotional facts are harder to change. And the reason why it's called the backfire effect is if you try to change somebody's emotional facts, right? Something about politics, a very heavy uh, you know, you could think of an example, right? Or with, you know, questions about sort of human origins, because it's inherently about, you know, it can talk on the, uh, theological issues. When you sort of try to convince somebody that they're wrong by the, for an emotional fact, they're going to sort of, it's going to backfire and they're going to come with more deep-seated belief in their original facts. So it's very hard in theory to change that kind of thing. So that's sort of what I go in those conversations thinking about. I sort of have it lucky. It's like a theologian or a, a seminary is going to invite me to come over there. For the most part, they're already willing to listen to these things. And what I tell them, because oftentimes it's not necessarily the theology students, it's their concern of when they, you know, go out in the world, what happens and how they talk to people, is I try to point out a couple of things, right? I say mm -hmm. that, you know, not every religious person is a creationist and not every anthropologist is a rabid scientist, a sci scientism of science is the only way to look at the past. So what right, I try to right. do when I'm having those conversations, I'm like, here's what the scientific narrative of where we come from is. And here's how it could help you understand things that are interesting to you. But what I think I probably do well, I wanna say, is just being respectful, right? Having that sort of open conversation. Um, oftentimes, depending upon whom it is, I'll say, you know, I was raised Jewish, which is very, very different from most of people's backgrounds who are feel, uh, religious folk. So I think basically the my answer is, that you have to do it with mutual respect and also realizing sometimes that we all have the same kinds of questions, right? Most theologians, they want to make the world a better place. They want to make the world more equitable and accessible for everybody. And so do anthropologists. So saying that, yes, we might disagree in the minutia of what happened, but overall, I think we can have those conversations and, you know, this is biased. I used to work at the University of Notre Dame where I was working with theologians. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have maybe a different view than, say, some of my colleagues might have. 
Right, right. And I think that's very, the points that you made are very important that, you know, not all religious people are completely against science and not all scientists are completely 100% um, into science. What was the word? Well, Sign- scientism. I mean, dogmatic. Scientism. There. Like, I'm thinking, right, of, I don't right. want to say names, but there's certainly some prominent, maybe not so prominent anymore, sort of a popularizers of science in the 90s and 2000s who are writing books about why, you know, believing in God is stupid, basically. And I think that is problematic. And that's sort of what where my work tries to push against. Because that right. kind of conversation, I think, goes nowhere. Right, right. It just leads to arguments and those just go in circles. So what are you working on right now? <laughs> so the, I mean, it honestly depends. I mean, I teach 130, 140 students a semester here. Wow. So most of the time during yeah. the semester, I'm just teaching and trying to keep up with emails and whatnot. The exciting <laughs> thing is, and this is very new, is my colleagues and I just got a large grant from a, the John Templeton Foundation. And a bunch of people who we've actually had on your pot on your cast before, like uh, Augustine Fuentes is associated with this grant as mm-hmm. well. And it's a very large project. My colleague Jennifer French, or Jenny French, who you also should interview because she's amazing. She's an archaeologist at the University of Liverpool, does a lot okay. of paleodemography like, stuff, like how many Neanderthals were there, what can we know about demography in the past? Mm. So Jenny and I are working on an aspect of this this grant is called the grant about concepts and concepts and basically looking at the question of how can ethnographic data better help us understand human origins and human evolution which has been done in the past but we're trying to take a more nuanced approach so what Mm -hmm. jenny and i are looking at is the concept of technology right so how has technology changed but in a very sort of hopefully different way one thing we've been thinking about, and again, this is very new. We just got, like, we officially got the grant a couple of months ago and just trying to get things in, in order is the idea of containers, right? So carrying things and how has carrying things changed over time? So we're looking at the ethnographic data now and then saying like, you know, how could that help us understand containers as a concept? Because, you know, pretty provocatively, some humans are containers for other humans. And that's a mm-hmm. sort of carrying, right? So what do we know about these technologies over time and how has sort of technology changed us and how have we changed technology, a sort of feedback loop? I mean, other folks are looking at racism as an example. Some are looking at deep sea divers, who those people who do the deep sea diving and hold their breath for long periods of time. Right. So there's all kinds of things. Um, and you know, those of you li- listening who want to know more, let me know because We're looking for postdocs and people to help the stuff because it's going to be a really cool project. That is sort of what what I'm gearing up to do right now in my copious spare time. (laughs) Yes, your copious spare amounts of time. And then also looking again at the question of the other, I'm sorry to interrupt. The other thing I'm working on is sort of um, sort of what I was doing my postdoc on was sort of like modern human origins and sort of early human behavior. So that's always sort of in the back of my mind. But mm-hmm. I'm taking a side branch when I'm, you know, in the middle of a semester. Right, right. I mean, I one day I hope to be in your position where I'm in a professor, or assistant professor, and I'm doing all my own research and everything. But I mean, first of all, just while we're recording, I just want to thank you for coming on because you just sound like you're so busy. I just I appreciate you spending the time to come on. Um, so this work that you're doing sounds fascinating and it really, the importance of what you're talking about, about containers really reminds me of what I'm doing in one of my archaeology theory classes and what I did last semester where I was studying, um, South America and the Andes and everything and their pottery cultures and everything. And I'm just thinking, I never thought how far back those things could have gone and that maybe even, yeah, Neanderthals had carrying containers. They must have, you know, it's for things. So what have you found that leads to that conclusion? Well, again, I mean, a lot of this work has been done by by Michelle Langley, an archaeologist in Australia. Uh, And like, 
there's not much, right? Because containers don't really preserve that well. And that's right. kind of why we're hoping that I have some students working on this right now, looking at databases of ethnographic research. That, you know, what do we find? What do we find more recent? And I think I'd say that the hook we're, we're trying to get is like, there's different ways to contain things, right? And they have the very different functions. But if we look at these functions as a large suite of things, if we don't focus on just, right, these are containers for carrying water, these are containers for carrying millet or what have you, but how have containers changed over time? It might give us a sort of a different way to think about these larger processes that are in effect. But, you know, we're sort of always at the point where like, as you know from archeology, span right? We don't get most of the stuff that's preserved unless mm -hmm. you have these really phenomenal sites. So that's sort of what we're trying to think about is could we see other things? You know, in a South African site, sometimes they have ostrich eggshells that are engraved with these little you know, drawings or stuff. Right, right. And you know, they're all cracked. So we don't know what they were function was, but the, 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 I think most folks would probably say they were used to sort of carry water or something, because that's what was done ethnographically known. So what does that mean? Can we use that to think more deeply about the role technology played, right? Rather than just saying, oh, this technology gave us a, a fitness, an increase in our ability to have kids. They, it's a lot more complex, right? Like, the, how has these changed the niche that humans live in? Right, and of course that, that human niche is just all so important on how we do everything that we do. Um, so while you're doing all of this, <laughs> how did COVID affect your work? Oof. Gosh, I guess it depends on you how, like, what you're, how you're going with the question. So I'm pretty open about the fact that I have two kids at home and mm -hmm. for the first year, I mean, from March, 2020 until a year and a half later, my kids were home and I was home. And we live in a, we're lucky enough to have a house, but it's a 900 square foot house with myself, two kids and uh, my wife. So it was a struggle to get anything done, uh, to be mm -hmm. honest with you all. Like I would still try to teach the best I could. Um, many of my students don't necessarily have good access to like Zoom or computers or Wi-Fi. So most of the time I was trying to figure out how to even do anything that was remotely good to like teaching wise. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was that I was lucky enough, I'd been in App State for a while, but uh, my position was not tenure earning. I wasn't in a tenure track job. And starting in fall 2019, I got a tenure track position here, which is like, you know, mm. like, like, it's so hard to get that. I got so, so lucky, right? Right, right. Of course, like then very soon after everything shut down, I had um, all this money sort of I had negotiated to like, go places, right? Mm -hmm. And suddenly I couldn't go anywhere. Um, so it sort of influenced that sort of like my plans and sort of research. So this is kind of when I began to think really deeply. I mean, I already thought about it, but like the pedagogy, the sort of teaching stuff, because that was stuff I could think about at home. Right? I didn't have to go. And it also kind of changed my mind a bit and sort of even like, I love field work. I think it's great, but do I always have to be doing field work? You know, I personally would rather be home with my kids than gone for two months somewhere. So it gave me a way to right. think about that as well. But yeah, I mean, it did, I think for, for all of us, anyone in a field-based uh, job, it made me really think about that. And of course, the second part is how students, you know, undergrads, grad students, how they were going to deal with this too. Because I was, I, got, I squeaked into the job just as everything went down, right? So like right. how you can now help people who are in the same position I was, but didn't have the sort of privilege of a tenure drop track job. Yeah, yeah. And also, it's, I'm still like most days, like, ah, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm so tired. <laughs> that definitely seems to be a theme among the anthropology professors that I have um, talked to. Hmm. It definitely, as we were talking about on Twitter the other day, keeping up with everything is just incredibly difficult to do, even for people who that's all they do. It's hard to keep up with everything. There's always new news coming out. What is your favorite piece 
of something new that you're aware of that's come out recently? <laughs> Well, okay, just this morning, and I, I just read the article, so I'm probably gonna get the details wrong, but I was reading an article looking at um, basically muscle attachments in the thumb and how those muscle attachments differ between humans and non-human primates, probably because of tool use. So what the mm -hmm. scientists did, and this is published in the journal Paleoanthropology, which is open access, uh, what they did is they went and looked at um, hominin fossils that have the, the, the phalanges and see, can we see those muscle attachments in hominins, like hominins being primates that are more closely to us than to any other living primate. So things on our evolutionary tree. And the question was, well, the, the backstory here for those who don't know is there's a hot mess about how often when we began using stone tools, right? And like sometime, I mean, like 3.3 million years ago, there's things that might be stone tools, but not everyone agrees upon that. There's cut mark bone that's also fairly old, but not everyone agrees those are really cut marks. So the, the, the example in this, in this piece was like, well, if we can see that the thumb has been evolving toward using stone tools, when did that begin? And what's kind of cool is they see like something like Homo naledi, which is not very old, uh, 250,000, mm -hmm. right? But even some earlier things begin to show this sort of unique muscle attachment. So that was kind of a cool idea. Like, you know, everyone's been, it's sort of a, why I liked about the paper was that it's the benefit of like what happens when you do read broadly, right? Because these scientists mm -hmm. found out about this new way to study muscle attachment, and then they applied it to a question that people have asked in a way no one's applied before. And that I think is something that I think is really cool when people do that. Definitely. I, um, in fact, came out this morning. I have not seen it yet, actually. Um, <laughs> but that sounds extremely interesting. And I just, speaking of tool use, you know, that's something I'm very interested in. And I assume when you're talking about the 3.3 million, you're talking about the ones that, um, is it Lomequi? Yeah, Lomequi, yeah. Lomequi, right. Um, what are your thoughts on those tools, possible <laughs> tools? Do you think they're... Yeah, I mean, I'm not a lithicist, so I'll, I'll say that at first, but I, I was at a co the conference when they kind of announced them and, you know, they, they were really large and mm -hmm. that's kind of surprising, but I have no reason for believing it's not accurate, right? I mean, certainly, you know, if you bought into a narrative that you have to have a certain brain size or cranial capacity to make stone tools, and then you see stone tools in osteopithecines that have small brains, then you might have reasons for doubting it, right? Maybe you're already preconceived to doubt these things. And, you know, I guess reasonable people can disagree upon like how those tools were flaked. But I mean, it seems like a pretty good airtight, airtight case to me that there's something interesting going on there, right? They're doing something novel or interesting. And mm -hmm. as we said before, changing the niche in which they live. So I'm not surprised at all. I, I suppose I have no reason to think it's not true. Okay, I, I personally, and of course, again, I am no expert on any of this, but I, I would like to think they are stone tools. I would like to think uh, Australopiths were possibly making stone tools. And we've always um, had, we've always had claims of parent like the robust Australopithecines using stone tools, right? It, just like. We, we thought they couldn't because we were told they could, right? We were told what makes us genus right. homo is stone tools. But that was just one hypothesis and it, it got sort of ingrained in the literature. And mm -hmm. I think a, a really benefit of like learning the history of the science we do is seeing where these things come from. Because like it's assumed that's the case, right? And then we sort of build up so much on this sort of these bricks of, oh, only, only the genus homo makes stone tools because we have to make ourselves seem special. And then we find exceptions and it kind of messes with our, these grand narratives we tell ourselves. Definitely, 100%. Now, one question that I do ask all of my guests, and I, I am told that is the hardest question. Um, who's your favorite hominin? Oh, dear God. That is a hard <laughs> question, right? Um, 
I would say, I mean, I'm a big fan of Homo erectus. I just mm-hmm. think in terms of like the things it did, right? I mean, it was so, di- I mean, in theory, so different than things came before. They're about 50% taller than the Australopithecines. Their cranial capacity is expanding. Their range is expanding. They're doing so many interesting things. You know, there's the Homo erectus uh, in Java. That's like mm-hmm. engraving perhaps on a clamshell. There's mm-hmm. evidence of the use of fire, right? So I think it seems like a very novel and interesting species. So that'd be my first guess. I probably, based upon this podcast, should say Homo naledi, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of Homo erectus, because I was actually thinking about them a lot last night. Um, so in Georgia, you know, we have at Dominici, Dominici, we have what some people call Homo erectus and what some people call Homo georgicus. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as I know, the first traces of fire go back about 1.5 million years. Now, these individuals were in Dominici prior to that, and it's a colder climate, so one would assume they would already have fire, correct? (laughs) I mean, you would think so, right? So we really need to, there's like this big opening we need to look for, really, where we really find where fire became, I guess, part of the human niche. So I I apologize for this beforehand, but like, Uh fire is a hot topic, right? Right, of course. No No pun intended. Right, but like, it, it, um, it, it's one of those things that we, 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 it's been a while since I've read all the the fire stuff, but like a couple of years ago, back, back, I looked at all this stuff, right? And yeah, I mean, I guess it's the thing, like, how are you going to have definitive proof of it, right? Mm-hmm. Because also, is it fire? Is it controlled fire? Are they taking advantage of, like, lightning strikes? I would think that you would have a very hard time living in a place like that without a campfire. Mm-hmm. Um, I would think that people, obviously, people are looking for evidence of this because it is so seen to be one of those things that humans do and non-human primates don't do. So I think we're looking for these things, but again, we need like the perfect preservation to find this stuff, right? So I would think that the more we expand our technology, our abilities to locate, you know, people do things like looking at, you know, um, how hot have they have they uh, gotten the coals, or how 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 baked, how burnt are the bones, and does that tell us something? I mean, the the, the real question is that's a, what my uh, one of my PhD advisors would call. A GQBNA, good question, but no answer. <laughs> but at, at this point, we don't know. Um, there's certainly people there who think Neanderthals couldn't control fire, but I kind of have a hard time imagining they were able to survive for so long in the during the ice age without it. Yeah, I wish yeah, I it seems a little, yeah. <laughs> but it it definitely seems to be a good mystery for people to be looking into, for sure. It's an attractive mystery, right? Because it's also something that kind of is easily to sort of demarcate. I think that's something that we want to maybe try to avoid trying to, because we want to we find that thing that makes us human, right? That's why fire is so alluring, because it seems like that's going to be the thing. Okay, we finally found it. And the history of paleoanthropology, and even anthropology in general, I think, is the history of learning why phrasing things in a way that says this group is human, this group is not, is really dangerous, mm-hmm. you know, it's really problematic. So I think, wow, it's a fascinating question. And I think we'll probably learn a lot more about it, so, you know, as people are looking in different places. It's just one thing, but right? it's not going to be the thing that makes us human. Right. That, kind of like, I guess that's my, would be my, um, my cautionary tale about it. You know, that being said, as always, we're probably taping this, and tomorrow they'll probably announce fire at three million years old, right? And then we're all <laughs> like, we're wrong. That, that is one of my most loved, but also most difficult challenges of what I do, as I'm sure you'll agree, is that the exciting new news is just amazing, but it comes out literally almost every day. And it... <laughs> one new discovery can change the entire field and it's unbelievable the way it works like you said Seth I mean it's it's really it's fun 
But yeah, I mean, every year I will print out or post my syllabus and then I'll put on Twitter, dear colleagues, please give me two weeks when nothing <laughs> comes out. And then somebody will like within a week announce a new find or a new thing from a new site. And you're like, darn it, folks, just one week of like seeing like <laughs> the top of it. But then it's fine, you know, like, as you know, with, with your world and sort of science communication or as a faculty member, it's really fun for me to go to class the next day and say, OMG, guys, like, look at what just happened. This just yeah. came out. Let me show you how fun my field is because we're always learning new things. I mm -hmm. think this becomes a narrative, going back to how do you engage students, right? There's a narrative that, like, it's been done. We know things. And we know a lot, but there's so much we don't know. We're finding more fossils and more samples and more data every day. And that's kind of the cool part about it. It's not a dull, you know, dead science because it's constantly changing. For sure. For, absolutely. I, I don't know if it's true, but I like to say it's one of the fastest changing sciences. Um, because like you said, literally, when you come out with your syllabus, it's like, the next day, your whole you need to change the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, I you know I was in grad school when the Neanderthal genome came out. I mean, like these things that are now not new. I mean, but paleogenomics, ancient DNA, all this stuff is just so it's changing the field in ways that we can't predict, right? And right. I think that's really exciting, but also really sometimes exhausting because there is no way to keep up with all of it. Even like I, when my dissertation work, I was looking at genetics, like I can't even keep up with all the genetic stuff anymore. You know, yeah. it used to be possible. Now there's so much new stuff that's so amazing and interesting about this field. And especially when you realize that there's like 7 million years of human evolutionary history, right? So, <laughs> you know, like how do you keep up with both, you know, a new Australopithecine find or whatever, and then sort of the people, sort of the movement of, early farmers in Europe, you know, how do you even manage to do that? I don't know. I, I wish I did. <laughs> yeah, it definitely seems like a challenge for anyone who is trying to communicate those things. So my next question, and I, I just had it, and of course it just slipped away, was... <laughs> What is, I don't know what it was, but here's a new question. <laughs> what is your favorite part of anthropology to teach? Gosh, I've never been asked that question. <laughs> I think in terms of impact, I would say talking about it, you know, the sort of how social constructs affects us, affect us. So I mm -hmm. think that's really important to talk about like race, sex, gender, all these issues. I enjoy teaching about that because that's where you can see the light bulbs going off in the students' heads when they suddenly get it, right? When we say racism is what causes race and then explaining what that means, right? When you can explain to them, you know, the sort of historical origins of, of these processes and how they affect people today, I enjoy teaching that. I mean, it's really hard and it's like, it's heavy. My other sort, my sort, in terms of fun, I mean, I love talking about primates in class. I am mm -hmm. not a primatologist, but like, honestly, the day I do primatology, I'm just so happy because mm -hmm. I spent the night before Googling adorable pictures of like pygmy marmosets and we did and like Emperor <laughs> Camerons. Mm -hmm. And I like that because it sort of gives students, you know, a break, right, as mm -hmm. well. So I think those are two very different way, things of teaching, types of teaching. Uh, and the last thing I'll say in terms of my favorite thing to teach, which probably should have been my answer, is this is going to sound like it's a cliche, but what I like it is when the students teach me, because at the very end of the semester, I don't do research papers or theses in, in class. My students do what's been called un-essays. Un so they take a project, a concept, like, you know, I'm trying to think of an example, like, you know, early hominins, and they learn a lot about it, and then they present it in a novel way. So like a year ago, a student did a, which hominin are you, personality mm. quiz. 
So we spent a while learning about what we know about different hominins, and it was kind of funny, but there was some sort of science behind that. Right. And then, I mean, that thing went viral in my field. It was even mentioned in the like the and the, the weekly Nature email. So, <laughs> like, you know, like what I really love is what you see is teaching students. I'll say that communication, as you know, is not just in the written word. So you can't you kind of see the stuff in the, behind me. All of these are projects my students have done. So I like teaching students that maybe they're not the best writers, but most people cannot write, but they can find, they, I mean, most people don't think they're good writers, but instead teaching them, hey, you can communicate in novel in different ways. I've had students do like put on dances and plays and write screenplays and do all kinds of fun things. So that would probably be my favorite part of teaching. I think that's amazing the way that you adapt your teaching style to your students and how you're feeling and that you have one thing that I'm very happy about this semester that in my school that didn't happen last semester is pretty much all the teachers have given up on tests like just multiple choice tests hmm. um and I think people are starting to realize that's not the way to test someone's ability of what they've learned. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other projects and fun things to do. And it sounds like you're on the forefront of that. And I think that's so exciting that you're doing all these little projects and fun things to get people really excited about what they're doing. Because I think that's important is getting them excited. I mean, like we said before, right? I I'll say, hopefully this does not become a rant. But I do think that <laughs> most people have intrinsic desire to learn many things about the world, right? People like my kids used, used to, kind of mostly still do, love watching nature documentaries, right? People like watching these things, learning about the world. And I think that edu you know, people love to learn, love to learn about the world, but education, the way it's done in our country and most of the world, does a disservice, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's why I came to these on essays, because I was like, I don't want to read 25 paragraph essays about bipedalism. But also my students don't want to write those, right? But what they do want to do is run down the hall and then have another student crawl down the hall and time how long <laughs> it takes and do a silly music video about that. Because they'll also like, they'll learn a useful skill, right? I mean, I also have my students always, every year they do infographics, right? So mm -hmm. they'll do like an infographic on a various aspect of human evolution. So yeah, I'm, I'm very hardcore in this stuff, like kind of becoming well known in my field that I don't grade my students anymore. I don't put a single grade on anything because grades are extrinsic, right? You, I, grades exist as a, as a way to force people to learn. And my mm -hmm. whole pedagogy is no, I don't have to force you because you're gonna wanna do this. It's gonna, I'm gonna make it relevant to you rather than make you feel like you have to memorize these facts. Like you point out with the exams, right? Most students forget the day after the exam because it's just cramming it in your head to memorize for an exam. And I don't think that's real learning in any sense. I completely agree. And I think I'm hoping that the our education system in this country will kind of lean that way a little more. We'll see. I know in my state of um, California, we got rid of the standardized state testing, uh, which both of my parents are teachers. And so um, they told me how much of a big deal that was mm -hmm. and how easier it was for literally everyone to just not have these standardized tests anymore. So I think changing the way that we do educate people and making them excited to learn is really the, the best way to get them to learn. Exactly, right? I mean, like, if you want to get me mad, send me an article about the quote unquote learning loss that's going on, right? Like, yeah, no, my kids are not le losing learning. My kids are dealing with a pandemic, right? And I think that when we try to quantify learning in ways that it can't, it, not everything that can be quantified, not everything that can be quantified should be quantified, right? Mm -hmm. And j it's just as if like my colleagues, right, anyone who's a professor can spend 20 minutes talking about how awful and annoying uh, student evaluations are because they don't really accurately gauge how good a professor is at teaching. 
I think the same thing is true of grades in general, right? They mm -hmm. only, and then you have the problem of like, who has the time to study? Who has the time to do all the work? Who has the time to read, right? So I think all these, I think that's sort of like what makes me the most excited about anthropology now is we always knew that was a problem. And now folks are really beginning to question, do we even have to do this? You know, do we have to grade in this way? Do we have to make learning be punitive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, that's, I can't agree with you more on the way you're, you're viewing these things. Um, so I do remember my question from earlier. <laughs> what do you think is next in the world of anthropology? What is it going to be a fossil find? Is it going to be protonomics? What's going to be the next big thing, in your opinion? <laughs> well, I could cheat because I do know some things I'm, that like, I'm part <laughs> of the project. But I do know some things, right? So I'm going to try to not be like, oh, I'm going to predict this. And like, you know, a couple months later, something comes out and like I seem really smart, right? Um, <laughs> And I thought about this question last night because I figured like that would be something we talk about. And now I'm trying to remember what my answer was going to be. I would say I think what's next is re-examining our core questions. Like we kind of talked about already, right? It used to be that we thought we're going to find that dividing line between us and them, right? That we're going to be able to find, oh, homo sapiens can be defined by this unique derived trait that appears on the skull or by this unique behavior that only modern humans, whatever the heck that means, do. And what I think the next major move is, and you know, I'm biased because this is what my work has been, my work and others have been talking about for a while, is to try to just like, stop even framing the question in that way, right? Stop framing the question in a way that's trying to divide rather than make an inclusive picture and to sort of move away from sort of this like, you know, like the archaeologists and like the, the trait list approach of like, you only have a city if you meet these 10 things that V. Gordon mm -hmm. Child said makes a city. And archaeologists, as far as I know, don't do that anymore, right? They have a much more nuanced view. I think paleoanthropology is moving in that way too. You know, we have the problem, of course, of oftentimes not knowing how human the things we're studying are. So that makes it harder. But I would say I think there's a move to sort of theoretically open that landscape up, right? And also to be more willing to look at and talk to and accept other forms of knowledge. But, but and like, at the same sense, as you know, I'm sure many of your listeners are aware, is like, who even gets to ask questions about the past is changing remarkably. But it used to be a very small set of people who had access to data were able to interpret, were sort of able to, and sort of had the positionality to interpret the data and would go to other countries, extract the resources and you know, put, lock them up and then do their work. So I think that that as well is sort of like, what's next is sort of like decolonizing paleoanthropology, right? Making mm -hmm. sure other people can ask the question, training the next generation. And this has been done for a while now, but I think really showing that, you know, we have to sort of make anthropology relevant again, so to speak. I think you, you know, the whole decolonizing paleoanthropology is such an important point because so much of what we know about evolution and biology comes from, you know, Victorian England and some ideas have not been changed since Darwin's day and they just, they just don't work anymore. <laughs> um, they just don't. And we do need to reevaluate where we are in a lot of positions, I think. And I've been reading recently that there's some people who, including uh, like Dr. Lee Berger, who, who just want to completely rethink what and who hominins are, where individuals fit, what they're called. And it might be time, I think, to kind of reevaluate where we're sitting. I mean, I don't think this could ever happen, but like my dream is get into a room, bunch of people and have all of the fossils we found, right? I mean, in terms of like, there's not that many major fossils, right? Get all the right. skulls from like 
you know, take the Near East, right? The Middle East, like all the skulls that have stuff that are down there, sit in a large lecture hall, have them all out there and think about what is it actually, what is that variation showing us, right? Is the mm -hmm. variation, variation, is the variation showing us discrete populations or continuous variation? And I think that would be a really cool thing to start thinking about, right? Is why do we feel the need to put things into these categories that we forget we create? So right. you know, going back to your question about your favorite hominin, right? First of all, I probably should have said uh, robust australopithecines because of my, you know, little sweater there. <laughs> but um, also, like, you know, I don't know how relevant these species names really are anymore in some sense, right? Like, how relevant is, say, Neanderthals or a different group than modern humans when they're interbreeding with each other, right? So, like, right. I just think that we really need to take a step back. And I think everyone knows this. Who are so vested, we're so, so trained in thinking this way, that it's going to be really, really hard. It's going to take the next generation of folks to really say, "Hey, what are we doing here? We need to rethink, you know, how we even how we talk about these ideas." Because that's the other problem too. The way we talk about these ideas influences the way pu the public think the public thinks about these ideas. So thinking like with your work of science communication, I'm going to say another place I think. The field is going is in training graduate students, undergraduates, you know, postdocs, faculty members, how to talk in a more equitable, easy way, right? How do we reach the public in a way that is engaging? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if we don't do that, our field is going to falter because there's so many problems right now with higher education, so much lack of funding that we have to go and say, here's why what we do matters. So I think that right. in order to do that, we may have to sort of, you know, spend more time in graduate schools talking about how you teach versus how do you, you know, use the R programming language. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's, you know, the, the issues of higher education, I'm only starting to really learn <laughs> about <laughs> oh, yeah. as I'm navigating these waters. Um, and I'm biased. I mean, I, I should allude to if uh, those of you listening. Um, so my my PhD advisor was John is is slash was John Hawks. Oh, I also know has been on your show before, I believe. And like you know, John has been for years pushing this narrative of going out there talking to people, having a public facing science work. So I think that is sort of something we have to continue to do, even if, you know, blogs get sort of overdone by Twitter and God knows what's gonna happen with Twitter now, or like where we're going, we have to think about these things and I think a more vibrant way. Like I have colleagues who are now doing TikTok videos and mm -hmm. my students, that they come to me and say, hey, have you seen this cool TikTok video about gender variation? And I'm like, no, but that's awesome. Cause they're learning these right. things through different media than even, uh, than I did for sure. Definitely. And it is, there are so many ways to reach people. I think not taking advantage of them is a flaw that, let's be honest, paleoanthropology is filled with a generation that is kind of passing to a point of they need to retire at this point. Um, and the new generation is coming in, and I think they are going to change the way that things are done in quite substantial ways. Yeah, and, you know, people often don't like that. I mean, the, the older set aren't going to like that. I mean, and I'm sort of probably part of that older set now, right? So, like, it, it is fundamentally interesting to see that happen, right, and see these new spaces open up and new kinds of people trying to sort of, like, find ways to engage in, with humor and with you know, podcasts or interactive videos, just trying to sort of, you know, bring, show people that sci science is fun, right? And that goes back to the whole right. thing we talked before. Like most people, I think their view of science is something they were forced to do in middle or high school with a Bunsen burner. And that's fine for some people, you know, but for most people, that's not what they want. And, right. you know, why sort of my sort of, focus in teaching and research has lately been like 
I was the student who loved this stuff, right? I stumbled upon anthropology as an undergrad. So, oh my God, this is the coolest thing ever. I really, really want to do this. The majority of people taking a class are going to think, okay, that's kind of cool, but I want to go get my degree in accounting. And I think it's up to us to say, okay, that's fine. That's good. But hold on a minute. Let me show you how what we do matters to what you do. Right. Definitely. Now, before we wrap up, do you have any advice or just wisdom that you would like to impart on any future students, people who are looking to get involved or just want to help out or anything? Do you have just some words of wisdom that you'd like to pass on? I mean, not sure if it's wisdom per se, but <laughs> I, could, I could think, I mean, like kind of like what I just said, I think if you're an undergrad or a grad student, I would suggest, right, putting the time in to think about like, not just learning what you're doing, but learning how to teach. Um, when I was in, in grad school, uh, one of my professors said, oh, well, everyone just can assumes you, you, you're gonna know how to teach. You don't really have to learn how to do it. But teaching is hard, right? And mm -hmm. I think so, putting the vested interest in learning about like, you know, in inclusive pedagogies, inclusive learning techniques is very helpful, especially if you want to kind of go into a professorship, right? Nowadays, like it's really hard to get a job. And if you can show you a good teacher, that really does matter, especially for the kind of places where most of us end up, right? The, the critical problem, I think, one of the problems with how we train people now is the majority of PhDs are going to elite R1 universities but they don't end up at elite R1s, right? Like I ended up at a smaller school where I'm teaching three classes a semester, sometimes four. So I think that would be one thing I'd think about. Another thing to think about is, you know, getting comfortable with, you know, talking to the public. I, for example, am very, um, not very extroverted. I find it very nerve wracking to do things like this, even though like it's just fun and once you get into it. <laughs> So I think realizing that like, <laughs> if I could do it, other people could do it too, right? So engaging and learning how to talk to people about what you do, right? Practice right. your, you know, your so-called elevator pitch of like the two minute, here's what I do thing. I think can help a lot. And also sort of, <laughs> this helps for undergrad, grad, whatever sort of position you're in, is find your people, right? Find a, core, a team of folks who maybe are within your same um, university or same interest level and like work on keeping that group as a, as a space to like vent, right? Cause things are hard. So have a space where you could like, I don't know, have a discord or whatever people do. I probably things I don't know about and like, <laughs> you know, a group me or whatever and say, oh, I had a bad day today. Like having that, I think is really, really helpful because this is not easy, right? And the last thing I'd say as well is to remember, as I think you and I were talking about before we started recording, is that like we all kind of feel like we don't know what we're doing, right? We all have this fear that we're that we're you know imposter phenomenon, right? That mm -hmm. it's not a it's not a, it's not a syndrome. It's a phenomenon. It's not on you. <laughs> the locus of responsibility is on the rest of the world, making us feel like we don't belong, right? And I think it's very important to realize that that doesn't go away. It's not like you're going to suddenly become successful and you're going to stop. You're going to stop thinking that. I'm constantly feeling that I'm an imposter. So I think just recognizing that and giving yourself the freedom to recognize that you see yourself as an imposter, but no one else does, right? Because everyone is so. Everyone thinks that they're the only one who doesn't know what they're doing. So giving yourself that, I think, really helps. And the I keep saying the last thing, but the last thing I'll do, then I'll shut up, <laughs> is um allowing yourself, giving you space to like realize that you can't do it all, right? Like you said, there's no way you can keep up with everything that happens in the world or even in your small field. And to remember when you see the person on Twitter who's saying, oh, I just read this great article. I just read this other great article. There's things they are not doing that you are doing, right? So no one can do it all. So allow yourself like, you know, allow yourself time to do what you want to do, right? If you're going to graduate school, Make sure you keep up your hobbies or read books outside of anthropology because that's what's going to make you a well-rounded, fun person to be around, right? And that helps you. Be, I mean, 
I'm not saying I'm a great communicator, but certainly the fact that I try to keep up with at least what my kids are watching so I can make jokes in class about, you know, My Little Ponies helps me at least sort of show that I try to engage at that level. Right, right. Well, I think that is, you know, you said they weren't wise words, but I think they were pretty, I think they are words that could help a lot of people out in some situations. And I only say things that I've been through, right? Like, I think that's a thing too. Like, and I do have the, I want to say as well, I have the privilege, right? As a as someone who has a job now to admit to these things. So like, I wouldn't say everyone should admit to having these sort of concerns, but like, I'm always willing to talk to anyone about these things too, because I've been through more than anyone should, most people should be, right, in life. And I think once you go through those things, the joy of being a professor is then you can make it easier for other people as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you ever sort of say, oh, maybe you're, you know, oh, I don't know if I can get into grad school. Think about, everyone thought that, right? Um, and think about, you know, okay, maybe somebody, I was told not to go to college, uh, that I'd fail out of college and that I didn't belong in graduate school. So sometimes it's helpful to say, well, I'm gonna prove all those people wrong. Definitely, 100%. I think that's the way people have to look at these challenges and that's the way people overcome them. For sure, absolutely. And I think those are absolutely great words to end on. <laughs> I want to thank you again, Professor Mark Kissel, for coming on. It was an absolute honor to have you. And uh, we'll see you next time on the next episode. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I had a great time. Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching this episode of The Story of Us. I hope you had an amazing time and learning experience. My guests and I had a great time putting this together for your enjoyment. I hope that you learned something and that there's always more to learn. If you would like to watch our previous episodes, please view them on my YouTube channel or my website, which is listed in the description below. And please subscribe and like to not miss future episodes. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.